And hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to give it a couple of minutes while people log in and the system catches up. Okay, I can see the, the numbers swelling, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today in today's webinar, What the CARES Act Means for Enterprises and Independence. Uh, my name is Brian Pena. I am the Chief of Market Strategy here at MBO Partners, and I'll be acting as your Master of Ceremonies, as it were. Uh, using the webinar features, all attendees will be muted and their uh, video should be turned off, but we are very, very interested in your questions. So please use the Q&A function native within the bar there to post your questions and we will do our best to answer them in real time. Um, this, we wanna recommend that you visit the CARES Act for Independence after this webinar. Uh, there are a lot of great resources that we're referencing here, as well as just a lot of stuff on the MBO site itself. So I please encourage you to do so. Uh, the information provided here does not constitute legal advice, tax or financial advice. It does not take into account your particular circumstances, objectives, legal and financial situations or needs. Before acting on any information, you should consider the appropriateness of the information for your situation in consultation with the professional advisor of your choosing. This is a rapidly changing area of law and will be subject to change and interpretation. And now that I've gotten that out of the way, I am pleased to kind of introduce uh, MBO Partners. Our mission is to make it easier for enterprises and top independent to work together. And we've been doing so for the last 20 years. I think that we always like to say that we were in the gig economy before the gig economy was a gig economy. And that commitment to independent professionals has been something that I personally have been really, really proud of. And so I wanna make sure I reference uh, our website, caresforindependence.com. Uh, that website went live on Monday after the law was passed on Friday. Uh, that rapid uh, of a development of such an incredible resource for independence is a true testament to the commitment that this organization has. And so I certainly hope you'll take the time to visit that. Great insight, not in this, as, uh, for those of you who are participating in an enterprise program, but also for individuals and how you can help your friends take advantage and, and protect their uh, situation during this challenging time. Speaking of which, I am incredibly pleased to introduce Miles Everton. Miles Everson is the CEO of MBO Partners and is the former Global Advisory and U.S. Vice Chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Previously led the U.S. Uh, financial services business for Pricewaterhouse during the 2008 financial crisis. During this crisis, Miles was instrumental in PwC uh, being given the mandate for the U.S. Department uh, of the Treasury to support them with risk management for the tr Troubled Asset Relief Program. I personally think this experience uh, in advising governments and institutions on how to deal with that crisis makes his perspective especially valuable. I know I certainly have benefited from his leadership, and I'm sure you will feel the same after today. So without further ado, Miles, take it away. Miles, are you muted? I was, sorry about that. Right. Thanks, there Brian, um, much appreciated. And uh, importantly, good day to, to all of you that have joined today and first and foremost, on behalf of everybody at MBO, we certainly hope that you and your family are um, handling this as best as possible. Everyone has their unique circumstances. And so I uh, certainly wish all the best to, to each of you. And so as we, as we think about MBO and independence, the best place to start, in my opinion, is really, you know, what happens in this face of uncertainty. And in the face of uncertainty, it's very common for fear to set in. And so it's setting in with certainly with individuals, you know, on this webinar, as well as sets in with our employees, it sets in with the independents. And, you know, MBO really believes in the enterprise and the independence and being able to work together. And our, our objective here is to help everyone in the face of fear, really to face everything and to rise up. The alternative is to kind of fear everything and turn away or to run. And that's not what we're about. We've been active, very active in trying to push along how we get some of the stimulus relief out to the independent contractors understanding the implications because we're in uncharted waters here, so to speak, in terms of the way stimulus could impact the independence. And so um, we will spend some time on that today and maybe just as a reminder of MBO's purpose, which is our purpose is to give people the control 
to do the work they love the way they want. It's no surprise to people on this call that the independent workforce is a fast growing, by our measure, it's about 41 million people. It'll double over the next seven or so years. It's a fast growing segment of the population. And you know, you ask any CEO what his or her most important asset is, it's their people. We believe that that, that includes the independent professionals that are contributing to the success of your companies and companies like yours. And so we do everything we can to make a better world for the independents, which then makes it easier for you to work with them as well. If we take a minute and just pause on a couple of the key implications that the COVID-19 has on both independents and employees, it's, you know, if you step back and uh, Sherm issued some guidance recently, which says one in five American workers say they'll be unable to meet basic financial needs in a week or less. Uh, I think we're starting to see that push through the system right now, um, based not only on what I read, but when I see some of the family members that I know and friends, um, that's happening. Likewise, 38% of knowledge workers will be unable to meet basic needs after one month or less. The good news for us in this is that the knowledge workers tend to have more runway, at least based on this survey, than the non-knowledge worker in the world that you know we work with with you and our independents is in the knowledge worker area. And then important for, I think all of you is that 60%, 64%, I should say, of consumers have stopped purchasing a brand after hearing news of that company's poor employee treatment. Um, while we don't know exactly what will happen as a result of this, but I do believe that um, coming out of the backside of this crisis, there will be a lot of um, hindsight applied to how companies treated their people their people being both their employees and their independent workforce. And so thinking through what the implications on the brand are right now are certainly very important. We're going to give you some ideas later in this webinar as to how we might um, help you think through what you might be able to do in that regard to protect your brand while also doing the best you can for your people and your companies. So let's set the stage for the COVID-19 um, relief and the CARES Act and MBO partners. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to get into some specific relief that's available under the CARES Act for independents. Um, and then we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the larger content macro environment around us and how we think the COVID can impact companies today and maybe give you things that we think you should be considering for some actions to specifically take within your companies right now. And so with that, I would like to, you know, introduce Gene Zeno. I can't think of anybody better, frankly, to speak and represent the independent contractors. He's been doing it for over 25 years. Um, he's got a tremendous heart for trying to help the independents and make them available for you. And so, Gene, with that, I'll turn it over to you and um, let you set the stage here. Thank you, Miles, and thank you all for uh, joining us, uh, I guess, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, and uh, sharing Miles' uh, comments and that I hope you're staying safe, uh, doing your social distancing, and um, everybody as well. Uh, we certainly are experiencing an unprecedented uh, kind of environment and way of working. So we want to share with you um, what we have done in the last, uh, I guess now it's the uh, last eight days or so since the CARES Act has been signed by our president and uh, put into law, uh, we kind of spent quite a bit of time um, going through the uh, 888 page uh, document to um, tease out what is it that the independent workers really need to know. We held uh, two webinars last week that covered just over about 2,300 uh, people. Uh, we continue to monitor and as these laws are evolving and um, also uh, as the um, intention of these um, stimulus and aid packages come out, there are certainly bumps and twists and turns. So we're trying to keep everybody updated. So. Um, if you could get to the next slide, uh, we'll um, 
the first thing here is let's talk about who it is that we're addressing uh, in these next few minutes that I will go through specifically what is uh, useful to the independent worker. And we're talking about people that are significant element of our workforce um, in our economy. And, and just in last year, we're talking about an economic um, impact to our uh, GDP of over just about $1.3 trillion with a T, right? So that's about uh, six or 7% of our uh, workforce. And um, in, just to put it in perspective, it's about the size of the entire economy of Spain. Obviously, the last few uh, weeks or months, this has changed. But um, what I'm really uh, very pleased about is for the first time, uh, I, uh, this CARES Act has actually acknowledged this segment of the workforce. And you're going to see in a few minutes uh, areas of the CARES Act that have been designed specifically to um, support the independent contractors, independent workers, gig workers, uh, that um, all of you and, and many in our economy rely on to execute our business. So um, let's get to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about about 41 million people in the United States. Uh, this is according to uh, nine years of research that we've been doing since 2011 uh, under a document that uh, is is prepared by an independent research firm called um, the State of Independence in America. It's the longest running study with the most data and talks about um, or, or provides information about the uh, size of the workforce and also their behaviors. Um, so we totally understand uh, you know, the, the growth of this workforce uh, and its importance. And that was the purpose of this study. And uh, you know, personally me, I'm pretty happy that it has um, been acknowledged now that this is a real significant part and, and our government is actually uh, taking, taking care in the CARES Act to, to, take, to uh, address it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much across the age group and these people actually earn more than the, their counterpart that's full time, about 15% more. Yeah, Miles, you would say something? Well, I was just going to add that of those 41 million, there's over 15 million that identify as being an independent as a full time. That's correct. Thank They're you. Either the major or a major breadwinner in households. And so, again, we, we take a very heartfelt approach to making sure we're doing all we can to help those 15 million people. Um, exactly. Yeah. Kind of so now that we know who we're talking about, let's get through the actual act. And, um, uh, and again, anyone that uh, you want to learn more about this, um, we, we pretty much have a treasure trove of information uh, on, on our site. And we've also have a site specifically for this called um, caresforindependence.com. So the CARES Act, which is this 880 something page bill is uh, uh, about two point it's, you know, there's different numbers. I, I believe it's close to $3 trillion and I believe it's growing because um, there's actually more funding that's needed to support the high demand for many of these programs. So um, let's get to the, uh, um, the next section, uh, next slide. So um, the CARES Act, what I'm gonna talk about is eight different features of this CARES Act. Uh, four of them that we're gonna talk about that are specifically for the small business uh, or the independent contractor. And uh, small business is defined as any company in general that has under 500 employees, but it also expanded the definition to include the independent contractor uh, sole proprietor. And then I'm gonna talk about four other features of the CARES Act that is available to anyone that's on this call or you know, general um, Americans in general of how they could also take advantage of aid packages that have been uh, made available with this um, multi-trillion dollar um, aid package. So for the small business, as you see on the screen, I'm gonna talk about deferring employer side tax or their self-employment tax. There's some um, uh, net operating losses that they could carry back to get tax refunds. There's actually a cash grant available and also loans for keeping um, uh, their, their independent business uh, operating. So we'll take the first one in the next slide. 
So um, uh, the, the, the CARES Act has um, provided for self-employment tax or the employer side of FICA. And for, you know, as, as a W-2 employee, you know that you have social security tax taken out of your, taken out of your pay. Um, also, the employer pays an equal amount. And it's about 6.2% of your wage gets paid by the employer and 6.2 gets take gets paid by the employee. When you're self-employed like an independent contractor, you have to pay both sides of that. And what this bill, uh, this act has done is enabled the deferral. It's not a loan. Um, I mean, it's not a, it's not a grant or it's not forgiven, but it's a deferral of paying those self-employment taxes uh, where you, through the end of this year, 2020, and you'll have to pay half of it by the end of 2021 and the other half by the end of 2022. So that's a cash flow liquidity assistance for independent contractors, whether they're 1099s, whether they're a little S corporation, whether they're a C corporation. So uh, I would encourage you to make sure all of your sole proprietor independent contractors are aware of this because it is a great way for them to at least have uh, reduced their quarterly tax payments or at the end of year, their, their entire um, uh, tax bill, at least to defer it for half of it for, for, uh, through 2021 and the other half through 2022. Hey, Gene, uh, that's one. If I can chime in again, um, I believe this would also be applicable to nonprofits with fewer than 500 employees. Is anyone that's paying the payroll tax is eligible? Because that was the question on here. Yes. No. It is available to nonprofits. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So that that's one. We go to the next one, and it's the um, uh, net operating loss carrybacks. And and in the tax law that was changed in at the end of 2017. They removed this from the um, traditional uh, tax benefits for, for companies and businesses and individuals that have businesses that are passed through to their personal return. And what this now has been reintroduced um, is if you have a loss in 2020, a, 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 a loss in your business uh, from more expenses than you have income, or in 2019, or in 2018, you could carry those back five years. And when you paid tax five years ago, you could get that back. So this is another huge benefit to get a big cash refund um, or removal of tax payments that you have to pay as a small business or as an independent contractor, which is really valuable. And again, this is another good feature for um, us to make sure that these independent contractors that we rely on doing business for us and executing our own uh, 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 mission is, is pretty important for them to be aware of this. So that's the second item. Um, the third is um, they actually have low interest loans and immediate grants available to them. Um, the CARES Act has um, expanded um, its economic industry disaster loan program, which has really been around for quite a while. And it's, it was designed for economic injuries uh, resulting from disasters like hurricanes, floods, um, you know, earthquakes. And since the uh, coronavirus is um, now a national disaster, it, it is applicable to all parts of the United States. And the Small Business Administration has created a site which is, uh, I would encourage people to go to if they feel they have uh, the ability to justify any kind of economic injury, it could be lost uh, inventories, it could be uh, lost uh, 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 income, and uh, it it will allow a um, someone on the SBA site to go through and answer some questions. It takes about ten minutes, and apply for a loan. And the loan is. Um, uh, available based on their credit score. So it's a really easy process. And even if you're eligible um, to uh, get the loan you applied for, they will give you a $10,000, up to a $10,000 grant that they will give to you three days after you apply for that 
uh, loan. And that is a very big um, benefit that a lot of people have already, I know, have already um, went to the SBA site and applied for that. So this is up to $10,000 you can get for free um, if you have losses. And um, the next one is also a loan on the next slide, which is, you might have heard some of the people in the news talk about this, which is the Paycheck Protection Program. And this is a little bit different. This is brand new. It has to uh, be issued by the bank. So even though it's SBA guaranteed um, and it's an SBA program, um, you, you do not apply for this on the small business site. You actually have to go to your bank and an independent contractor or self-employed or small business goes to their bank and they basically want you to keep your employees paid uh, for, the, for, for the next eight weeks after you receive this loan. And it's, it's, uh, it's to prevent people from going on unemployment. Uh, and what, how it works is you look at what your um, monthly payroll was last year, what your average was, and the loan could be two and a half times that amount as long as you use those funds for paying workers that are uh, in, your, in your business for the following eight weeks after you receive the loan, you will have that loan forgiven. Um, and if you, if you have a reduced payroll, the amount forgiven will be slightly reduced proportionately, but it's a, another way for um, businesses and independent contractors for their own income can do this. So whatever they were earning last year, um, they can get two and a half times that now as a supplement, as long as they can keep themselves um, uh, in the same uh, payment uh, of paying themselves for that amount of money. So it's actually a really good way for 1099s, um, self-employed independent contractors to um, get themselves this type of funding. Now you can't double dip. So if you went and got that $10,000 grant I just talked about in the previous, you can't use that again for the same amount unless you, you can stack them though. So if your losses are so large where it's more than two and a half times your last year's uh, payroll that you're, you're, uh, you have as a loss, you can get both. Uh, so the, both of these programs are, are really valuable. And I think um, uh, there's also some, um, issues right now trying to get money out as quickly as our government wants to get them out. And a lot of the banks are having a little bit of a, uh, a surge problem. But my understanding is this coming week, we should start seeing these uh, checks being released and these funds being released to the people that need them. So that's the four for the businesses. It's the two loans, uh, the, and the carry back of losses to get a refund um, and, and the deferral of their self-employment tax. So those are, those are four items that I would encourage everybody making sure their independent contractors know. The next four are for individuals, any American, all of us on the phone uh, can, can be um, uh, eligible for, for these. So it's uh, unemployment benefits, uh, direct cash right to your bank account, which we'll talk about, uh, the ability to get cash out of your retirement accounts, and also the extension of our filing of taxes. So you go to the next slide. Um, so unemployment has been significantly enhanced for those that are unfortunate that have lost their jobs um, and uh, are, are needing to go to un, uh, on the unemployment rolls. You have to go to your state. It's not a federal program. It's, it's administered by the state. Each state has their own kind of rules on how they uh, will issue unemployment. But in general, it's about $400 a week or uh, at a cap or 50% of your wage, whichever is lower. Um, and then on top of that, the CARES Act has added $600 per week to that amount. So if you take the $400 example um, and you add the $600 to it, um, that's about $1,000 a week for unemployment. Um, now, the $600 is only available for four months paid on top of the state amount um, that you, you would get, but the um, uh, rest of the unemployment will go throughout the end of the year, uh, and there's no waiting period. So 
it's a, it's a it's a really good way for people that have been um, put out of work to get a significant amount of cash uh, to keep them going. And um, uh, this has been a very popular program. I know it's working well in some states and in some states they, again, because of the surge, um, it, it's difficult. They also have added for the first time the ability to have self-employed and gig workers to apply for unemployment, which is brand new. Uh, I believe this is only going to be available, you know, during this period, um, but it is a recognition that um, they want to keep the uh, self-employed and, un, un, and, and independent contractor workers to uh, be protected, and this is yet another way to do that. Uh, the next one is, um, uh, on the next slide, is the ability to get direct cash directly to, to your bank account. And this is available for all Americans. This is getting wired directly to your bank uh, based on your tax return of last year if you qualify. And to qualify, you have to make under $99,000 a year. Um, or if you're married, uh, household, um, uh, you, you're, you double that or um, that's $198,000. Um, underneath that, um, if you are under 75,000 or for joint filer 150, you actually would get $1,200 each um, uh, and $500 per child. So uh, an individual that is um, earning you know, under $75,000 will get, get $1,200. If they have a child, they'll get $1,700. Uh, if they're married and both um, together earn under 150,000, they get 2,400. Plus uh, if they have two children, another thousand dollars. It does phase out once you achieve, um, exceed those, those limits of 198,000 if you're married or 100 and, um, or 99,000 if you're single. Um, and those are based on your tax return, your adjusted gross income. So if, even if you're doing half of uh, uh, independent contractor work and half W-2, it combines together on your adjusted gross income. So it, uh, it works for both uh, individuals uh, that are W-2 as well as independent contractors. So $1,200 per individual and $500 per child is, uh, is yet another source of aid. Um, the next is interesting. It's, it's a, a way to get uh, income from your retirement plan. And if we go to the next slide, um, they've, re they've relaxed the rules for getting cash out of your retirement plans. Um, you could uh, actually borrow $100,000 um, uh, from your uh, retirement plan. They relax, relax those rules that used to be for $50,000 and, and uh, you could have up to six years to pay that back. If you are in a situation, unfortunately, where you either have been diagnosed with the um, uh, coronavirus or you're caring for someone that has, you could take that $100,000 out and you don't have to pay it back, but you would have to pay tax on it over the following three years. So those are two new rules that are available to everybody uh, who has retirement accounts and wants to get uh, early access to those funds. And then the last item uh, is, I think what everybody knows is that tax day is now July 15th. So um, you don't have to pay your tax or file your tax form until July 15th from April 15th. You still, if you're an independent contractor though, you still have to file your quarterly taxes on time. So those are the four things for the individuals, right? So the, uh, here your extension of the taxes, your ability to retirement, uh, uh, to take money out of your retirement plan, the ability to get uh, the uh, rebates directly from the treasury department into your bank account for the $1,200 or $500 per child. And then um, also um, the, the unemployment benefits. So those are, those are um, uh, kind of a high level summary of the CARES Act. Hopefully you found that to be somewhat uh, informative and I'm gonna give it back to Miles who now will talk about uh, what enterprises would need to do. Uh, great, hey, thanks, Gene. And we know that we have a few questions that have come in. We're gonna cover those questions when we get to the end. I got just a, a few minutes here to share some thinking about modern business models and why events like COVID-19 remind us 
why it's so important to have a modern business model as opposed to an antiquated one. And since I came to MBO about nine months ago, I was leveraging my experience of having advised many of the world's largest companies, um, not only on strategy, but on risk mitigation and how you respond to an increasingly um, volatile environment around us. If we could go to the next slide, please, Brian. Um, and so we've identified this in, in four forces that are changing our world. And the first is the rate of change is accelerating. And I think most people would say, gee, thanks, we know that, Miles. But the significance of the rate of change accelerating for businesses is that there's innovations. The rate of new innovations is also accelerating. And it's when there are innovations that converge and high societal impact that this really matters. So I'll give you an example. When you know, AI was first invented and announced in 1959, it was effectively a non-event until the mid 90s when some data handling and technology would made it, made it possible to use the data. And it really didn't hit any mass scale until the last 15 or so years when you had the ability to have networks that could handle big data you had the ability to have systems that handle big data, and you have the AI to apply to the data sets and scanning technologies to collect data. And so it's the convergence of, <clears throat> excuse me, the convergence of innovations. And, and when you have innovations that converge and have societal impact, that progress is actually deflationary. And so I'll give you an, an example here, which is most of us have a smartphone today. And if you go back to just, you know, we didn't have smartphones even 25 years ago. And today, the computing power of that smartphone for $1,000 costs dramatically less than what it cost to have a supercomputer in the 1970s. Likewise, when you look at the decoding of the genome, it was $100 million to decode it in 2000. And today, you can get your genome decoded for less than $1,000. And that's because it has massive societal impact. The next one on the horizon, which I think we're going to see hit us very, you know, at a faster rate now that we're experiencing this need for remote work and social distancing is 5G. 5G will enable a tremendous amount of work to be done remotely that was not possible or is not possible without a reliable 5G communications network today. And then the third one is the power of knowledge flows. And the, poly, the, the power of knowledge flows is really to contrast it to a philosophy of knowledge stocks. And so knowledge stocks is where you have knowledge or intellectual property that you trade in one-on-one -on -one binary transactions. And that's the way the world operated for many, many years. But as we've seen, the power of knowledge flows, certainly with open source technologies, many of the most innovative technology and breakthroughs that are coming today is because of knowledge flows, not because of knowledge stocks. We see this in the realm of people and human capital management as well, that you really want access to all of the best talent on the planet, not just the 100% captive employee work base. You want to have access to independent professionals as well. And that's part of what's driving the fact that these 41 million Americans is going to double over the next several years. Um, to be a much more significant and pronounced impact on the U.S. workforce and the U.S. economy. And this leads us to the fourth item, which frankly has been around for hundreds of years, which is the fractionalization of everything. And the fractionalization, some examples, what I mean by that is in 1602, the East Dutch Indies Company had issues around the risk associated with shipping product across the world, and if they had, frankly, disease on the ship and or ran into a storm, they wouldn't be able to make the, the delivery of the goods. And so the investors decided to diversify their risk by creating a publicly traded company. So the first publicly traded company was created in 1602 to diversify risk. And now today, you can think of the fractionalization of things like in the 80s, late 80s, when mortgage-backed securities came into being. You know, we talk about home ownership in the United States. The reality is only 25% of Americans will ever hold the deed or title to their home. 
Otherwise, the bank will have it and they'll owe a mortgage. However, anybody that has a balance inv fund investment in their 401k or any other investment strategy, they own part of somebody else's house in what's called a mortgage-backed security. It's the fractionalization of home ownership in the United States. And then you can think of the fractionalization of all kinds of assets, including our homes. People have now fractionalized their homes because you can with a modern business model. And so we believe that what's happening and what MBO is helping folks like you and people that want to have a different career is we're fractionalizing the human career and the human workday. We're doing that by making it possible for people to work remotely, to work the way they want to do, the, you know, and do the work that they love. And this is a trend that is bigger than any company or any individual country that is, doesn't show any signs of, um, uh, stopping anytime soon. And so one way that you can think about the fractionalization of your workforce is through talent pooling. And what we mean by talent pooling is, can you please advance the slide, Brian? Yeah. Is creating a talent pool of people that are known to you and that you can access directly. It's a known talent pool and you get direct access to that talent pool and so where does this talent pool come from is what some people obviously often ask us. And trusted talent, when you talk to most people in companies, they would say that the best talent is trusted or referred talent. And so we know that there are many, many millions, frankly, of Americans that will be in transition right now in terms of their work status. So you can get them from current independence, you can get alumni independence, you can get people in transition, you can get retired employees. We have companies that have come to us because they're bringing a retired workforce back to work right now because they're in high demand areas. And so what you can see is that there's certainly a, a possibility in logic behind doing talent pooling and getting direct access to known talent. And so when we think about what all this means to an individual enterprise, we've come down to some things that enterprises can be doing right now. And there's really four items that an enterprise can be doing right now. And so actions that you should think about taking. Number one is we do believe that helping independents financially is important. And you can do that one way by directing them to the caresforindependence.com worksite that we, website that we had referred to earlier. There's lots of good information there for them. And you know, the second is to help independents find work and whether that's work in your own enterprise or if you have people in transition, direct workers to the MBO transitions where we're helping them figure out how do they become um, a member of the MBO platform or they could become a member of your own community, which is the third item, which is build your own pool of known talent. One thing we know is that it's a lot easier to stop work than it is to start work. And the easiest way to test that is look at the, how quickly layoffs occurred and furloughs occurred, and then compare that to how long it takes to bring people to work and hire them onto your company. And we will get through this as a, as a country. And so having a talent pool of people that's known to you that you could ramp up quickly makes you a much more resilient business model. But you should start that now, not after the recovery starts, because you'll be behind the eight ball at that point. And then finally, if you really want to get aggressive and look at how you think about having a modern and resilient workforce is we have a very specific approach and views on how you would do a workforce optimization strategy that allows you to build a deeper bench, have more access to talent, and at the same time, be able to scale your cost structure with the volatility of your demand side of your business. So these are all things that we think are important to any um, any company that's saying, well, where do we go from here on the backside of this crisis? So what we're hopeful of here is, and we're opening it up for some questions we'll go through now, is that what you've gotten out of today's discussion between Brian, Jean, and I is we're very zeroed in on how we help talent through this tough time and make sure that they have line of sight to the financial support, frankly, that they can get. But I think certainly we at MBO believe we have an obligation and we certainly would think that it's an opportunity for you to enhance your brand with a broad base of talent by taking some of the actions that I set out here on this page. 
So with that, Brian, I'll turn it back to you and let's get after some of the questions. Yeah, and uh, thank you to those of you who have submitted questions. And just while we go and address those questions, I'm going to take the time to put a, a quick poll up so we can see how you guys are uh, uh, responding to this crisis as a whole. But let's go ahead while we're waiting for the polls to be answered. Uh, I guess, Gene, this is a submitted question uh, for you. Gene, can you explain any more about this 6.2% uh, payroll tax deferral? Is that for specific employees that are impacted by COVID-19 or for all employees on payroll? Sure. So it's, it's specifically for employers uh, and self-employed. So the 6.2%, if you're self-employed, is half of what's called self-employment tax. And it's for anyone that wants to do it. Again, it's not a freebie, it's a deferral of the tax. So everybody that's paying self-employment tax or their employer share of tax can push that out um, till the end of 2021 and the end of 2022 uh, for the balance of this year. So um, it's basically giving you some more cash to operate this year or removing a, a payment from you. Uh, it's still a loan. You still have to pay it back um, and, you could, you, and you don't have to do it. But uh, I would think every self-employed and small business that's really looking to uh, um, preserve as much cash as possible during this time of declining uh, economic activity, this is a benefit to remove some payments and some obligations. But it's not just for people that are sick or have an, it's for any active uh, established independent contractor or small business. And I think it's an important thing to reinforce, Gene, that this deferral is just that it's a deferral. It is not a get out of jail free card, like this no. is a, a free discount. This is money that has to eventually be paid back. Right. You need to make sure that your, your partners are, are planning accordingly if they do choose to take that reduction. That's right. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Here's another question. This is for Miles. Uh, Miles, how are companies dealing with getting background checks? Um, it seems like they're getting challenges with background checks being done in a timely manner. How are companies dealing with that? Yeah, well, first of all, getting background checks in a timely manner right now is difficult in most situations. And it tends to be facts and circumstances because much of the you know, source of the background checks tends to be local governmental agencies that provide that background check. And many of those are not open for service right now. So that's difficult. We do have um, people that, companies that have looked at what I'll call a lighter touch on the background check to try to get the velocity um, of people going through and then the third thing I would add is, you know, we've done a fair bit of looking at, you know, what are the benefits of background checks and what do you use them for when you get the background check done? And I know it's a debatable topic, but um, candidly, in this time, we have some people that have really relaxed the rules on background checks because when they reflect on what they typically do, um, it's more of a safety net than it is an informative decision-making tool. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Gene, this question's uh, for you. Uh, what, what can we do for our independent contractors and extended workforce who are having challenges getting through to overloaded state unemployment departments? I know a lot of people are complaining of websites crashing and, and the whole and, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, that's a huge problem. And it's really depends on the state. You know, um, I know in I know New York actually is doing quite well, believe it, uh, even though they've got these other problems. Um, they're getting their payments out right away. Um, there are some states that are really um, uh, overburdened. And, and uh, you know, a lot of states have systems that are 30 or 40 years old. Um, they've got issues of uh, unprecedented, unprecedented amount of volume hitting that hitting their system, both in terms of workers, they're also having to do it while workers are remote. The, these are the state workers. And then they got to figure out how do I deal with, you know, how do I pay an independent contractor to prove out that uh, they got laid off? So it's a, it's a series of issues. I would say what you tell people is keep being, being persistent and follow it up. It will get through. Um, you know, Miles has this analogy of, uh, 
just a snake eating um, I don't know a, a pig or a rat um, and it's <laughs> your body. And right now it's just past the head. So um, you've got to give it a little time. Everything is over overloaded right now, um, and um, uh, and and that's really it. There's really no other answer. It will. It's the law. It will. They will get paid, and they will get the benefits of unemployment from the date they filed it. But they'll probably have a retroactive um, payment. Fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and share uh, the survey results. I don't know if you can see see the results on the screen, gentlemen, but. Um, uh, across the options, the number one change that people have been making is driving towards remote work. Second only to happily, no changes, resources are still working. They haven't seen a change in those usage. Can you speak to any challenges, uh, either of you, uh, that feel companies need to address as they start, start to look at more remote work situations? Yeah, look, I'll go first. Um, I, I think this is a positive as it relates to, well, a couple things. Number one is, I think what this pandemic has highlighted is that companies need a deeper bench of remote capability than what they thought they needed. Okay. And that's, I would argue is both the depth of the resource, the human resource pool they have available to them. Um, but equally important, I think companies are learning that perhaps the way that they've thought about the security of their assets, which is largely done through, being in the business of administering hardware to independent contractors, that they may not have to do that because they've now activated and have fully functioning virtual security desktops um, that will utilize native devices. I've talked to numerous companies in the last week that have said that they've been able to activate that and the security protocols allow them to control and secure the environment. So as it relates to independence, and being able to use independence on the backside of this crisis, I think we're going to see that companies are more equipped to deal with that from a technological perspective, which will increase the velocity of being able to deploy independence because oftentimes the hardware distribution becomes a bottleneck in getting people deployed quickly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think um, you know, one of the biggest impediments to change whether it's personal, whether it's your art, whether it's your company or whether it's government or society, the biggest impediment to change is always the status quo and the inertia uh, of that. And this pandemic and the forcing of people to work remote and to work differently has um, pretty much destroyed status quo in many ways and certainly has loosened it up to, to enable change to happen at a more rapid pace, which is one of Miles' four trends. I think you're gonna see the acceleration of change and even things we're not even thinking about right now that are gonna uh, happen as a result of this. It will definitely change things. And I think one of them is going to be the ability for people to realize, hey, I'm, I, could, I could work remote and I could work for several different clients at the same time, several different companies. Uh, I feel safer working at home. Um, I actually have more time. Um, I think we're going to see more people being independent. I think we're going to see more companies having access to a wider group of people that are fractionalizing their day, but getting more work done and more agile and more access to more uh, um, capability because you've got more connections to more people. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. And, um, you know, it certainly uh, will be will be different. Thank you, Gene. Uh, and this is also, Gene, this is another question for you. Um, one of the questions or concerns that a lot of people have had over the last couple of weeks is they continue to pay their independent workforce, even though they're not working just to keep them kind of engaged and keep them in, you know, keep them in their ecosphere. Um, obviously doing so is, is unique, but it is certainly a, a common theme. Do you see any additional co-employment risks by paying these ICs, even though they may not be doing work under an SOW? So if I understand your question, Brian, you're asking me if a company decides to pay its independent contractors, even though they cannot work. Yes. Does that then trigger more favorable towards employee versus independent contractor from a risk point of view. And obviously that is, 
Then exactly. Yes, that's the question. This has never been tested before. Um, I'll, I'll just give my my thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I think it's very noble, and I think it's a great thing to do. I think we need to be careful how we do it because three years from now, when people look back, you know, who knows? There there, there could be, you know, class action lawsuits and other things. So we still need to be smart about worker classification. Um, my suggestion would be that number one. Uh, you try to augment work so they could do the work remotely, even if it's different work. So keep them working, but keep them doing something that's of value to the company so that it is still a business to business relationship. Um, you know, you, you really wouldn't be giving work out to another vendor of yours or a competitor or not even a competitor, but, but someone else in that's delivering your product if you didn't get the product. But being a good partner and having a good services supply chain is important to protect. So yes, if you can keep them busy, even if it's different types of work, pay them for doing that. The other thing you could do is obviously give, um, just like we're doing now, but doing it actually even more specifically for your um, independent contractor workforce, is counsel them on what they could be doing to keep themselves um, active and billable uh, and get access to a lot of these, you know, benefits that's out in this CARES Act. I mean, the, the CARES Act, by the way, is the third phase. Um, and I, there's a fourth phase that's coming soon. I mean, we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars that our government is putting into the economy. Make sure these people that maybe don't have the lawyers and resources to figure out how to go get it, help them go out there and get it. And that would be another way to help them stay active and and viable and keep them uh, as loyal and you become a client of choice, which is really what you wanna be to build those communities that Miles just talked about in terms of um, um, these talent pools. Thank you, and we have another question. Uh, do you foresee any changes to IRS regulations pertaining to ICs coming out of this crisis? That's for both of you. I mean, I, I do. I, I think you're gonna see something that we've been talking about for years that there needs to be either a harmonization of the rules in terms of what is an independent contractor versus an employee. And as you know, Brian, all these different states, everybody's got different rules and it's kind of very confusing for a company that needs to use these people to execute work. So one, I think harmonization of these rules will be something that could come out of this. And I also think that there's gonna be a safe harbor something that we've been talking about for years of um, having some level of accreditation that if someone really wants to be an independent contractor, an independent worker, self-employed, they're able to support themselves, they're able to make a, a certain dollar amount that they could cover their own benefits and, and they don't need to rely on their client, if you will, for uh, entitlements. They should have a, um, uh, to give their client a, a, a safe harbor pass that they're not gonna, their client's not gonna have to be worried about reclassification or worker classification risk. Um, on the other hand, there's people that will probably be forced into independent contracting work and they, they should clearly be employees. So, um, you know, I think there'll be clearer, a brighter line as to what is an independent contractor versus an employee. And um, uh, I, I, I hope that's the case anyway. Thank you. Uh, Miles, uh, based on your experience, what are the things that we need to look for when anticipating the eventual turnaround? What are some of the things that you feel will be harbingers of a turnaround? Yeah, so I'll start with um, the, the idea, I guess, or the thought process that looking beyond the current crisis is really important because on the backside of any big crisis, what you'll see is you'll see some companies that really emerge much, much stronger and take advantage, if you will, of capitalizing on the change that Gene referred to earlier, which is the status quo is the enemy of change. And the status quo is getting disrupted. And so taking that and turning it into, you know, not just tactical, but strategic decisions will be really critical um, for companies. And I think that this one in particular is hitting right at the heart of what their workforce needs to look like and should look like. And so we will see 
companies emerge much stronger um, that really leverage the remote work. They figure out how to use technology to work. They use the a deeper bench of independence. And you know, I'm not just saying this, Brian, because of the pandemic. I mean, I I'm at MBO because I saw this trend some years ago in terms of what I th where I think the world is going. And I think that the pandemic is just merely an impetus to drive this change and accelerate it. Um, there's lots of things in the past, you know, hundreds of years that should have been done but didn't get done until there was a crisis to force the change. And I think that's where we're at. So what I'm saying is um, you can either be a protectionist and try to hold on to the past. You can be complacent and decide that what you're going to do is just watch or you can decide that you're going to be the shaper of the future. And if you decide you're going to be the shaper of the future of your country and your industry and your company, then you'll be more proactive in dealing with these situations. So deliberate choices and clear execution on where you need to be, not where you are today. I mean, I've seen this multiple, I've been through now three different major epidemics, not epidemics, but crises. And every one of them, you can see a pattern of who emerges stronger. Thank you. Gene, any thoughts uh, on, the, on the same topic? What's next? Um, no, I, I, think, I think we covered it. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's call. We certainly hope you uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, the webinar will be available for replay. Um, you'll always send a link as well as the downloads for the slides themselves. Um, thanks, everybody. Stay safe, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you. Thanks, folks.